here. Can you all hear me all right with this? Okay. So this morning, uh, obviously, we have uh, would like to thank everyone for coming out. Uh, we have five of our physicians talking about acute management of orthopedic injuries this morning. Um, I know personally, in addition to the people you'd see in the office and everything else associated with your clinical practice, having the neighbors, the nieces, the nephews, your kids, teams, you'll get plenty of questions about all type of acute injuries and what we're supposed to do about those at those particular situations. So hopefully we can help you out with uh, any clinical type of questions and then your everyday type of questions you may get as well. I'd like to say thanks to our sponsor, which is Fidelity Home Healthcare. So they're out front in the hall, which you may have seen on the way out, on the way in. We appreciate their help with this this morning. And our first talk uh, this morning, our first pre uh, presenter is Dr. Michael Johnson. He's a professor of plastic surgery at Wright State University Boone Shoft School of Medicine. He serves as chair of the Division of Plastic Surgery as well as Plastic Surgery Residency Program Director. A graduate of, Wright's, of Ohio State University College of Pharmacy, he attended medical school at University of Cincinnati, certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery, and has spent 17 years in clinical practice in plastic surgery, including burn and wound care, and major extremity soft tissue reconstruction. So first of all, I'd like to say welcome Dr. Michael Johnson. Well, welcome, uh, thanks Dr. Ellis for that uh, introduction. Um, today uh, we're gonna talk about the initial evaluation and treatment of minor burns and lacerations and um, this has something to do with orthopedic surgery in the sense and sports injuries in the sense that uh, you'll see a lot of these nicks and cuts that people get on the sidelines, friction burns and those kind of things. But some of you that are in primary care will also see this in your office and I think um, hopefully I'll be able to um, dispel a few myths that have been perpetuated throughout the years that we all learn in medical school and you get told not to do this and not to do this and there's very uh, set guidelines and, and there's been there's a lot of things that I've learned over the years that we really just have found not to be not to be true uh, necessarily in active clinical practice so uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end but we'll try and uh, progress through this um, and then uh, kind of hopefully it'll stimulate some discussion at the end so I have no disclosures to make I've done uh, funded uh, clinical research for KCI and Baxter Corporation in the past but nothing active at this time um, so as I mentioned, uh, we'll discuss the mechanisms of lacerations and minor burns and uh, potential educational opportunities for prevention. Also, the examination and evaluation. Some of my, um, some of, <laughs> Cindy's uh, getting on my case again. Some of the, what I have will overlap a little bit with the hand lecture that, that'll be later, but it'll hopefully kind of just set the stage for what you'll learn uh, later on in the morning. Um, and also, uh, we'll review some of the non-operative and operative treatments of uh, laceration and burns. So let's talk a little bit about the mechanisms. Uh, mechanisms include falls, assaults, um, motor vehicle crashes, sports injuries for lacerations. Um, in burns, uh, most common mechanisms are scalds, flames, contact burns, and friction burns. Um, I think we had a, an interesting, in, in fact, you can talk to the Fidelity people, we had a very interesting uh, talk at the Fidelity board meeting about um, fall risks in elderly patients, and I thought that was, that was an extremely good uh, talk about um, vestibular rehab and, um, and that kind of thing. So Fidelity has a program going on. I'll just put a little plug in for them right now uh, to stimulate any discussion with Fidelity you might have about that. So this is what we kind of want to see with falls. You see a, a fall, a bump on the head, and hematoma, and a lot of times they don't reach the plastic surgeon right away, but you see these kind of hematomas that really need to be addressed uh, sooner rather than later most of the time. Um, and those typically need to be drained, and size drained and evacuated before the healing can really start. Otherwise, I've seen them per perpetuate for six weeks. They're longer sometimes before they actually re reach our office. People just think, oh, that bump will go away but sometimes it needs to be evaluated a little bit earlier. In terms of uh, prevention, again, uh, proper identification of patients at risk for falls, uh, in the elderly especially. Um, and I, I think that that's a really, again, a really important factor. 
um, the, the falls, um, not only is it just falls, but I think as, as we progress in the future, we're going to have more people that in the elderly, we really want to try and increase their activity, increase their mobility, increase their, li- their quality of life. And a lot of times with this vestibular issues that they have, they don't have the confidence to get out there and exercise and do the things that they used to do. And I think some of this is just a matter of, um, of that kind of rehab can really be important. Uh, prevention also, of course, the seat belts and helmet issues and then uh, sports equipment and concussions, those are, those are uh, a hot topic now. Burns, the incidence of major burns has really gone down over the, over the years uh, due to uh, American Burn Association's uh, burn prevention efforts and uh, work with fire safety and those kind of things. We, we see a lot of minor burns still um, in the burn center at, at Miami Valley, but we don't see as many major burns as we used to. Uh, we probably only see maybe two or three, forty um, percent or more burns a year now, as opposed to we used to see twenty or more. Uh, you know, when I first started twenty years ago or so. So it's really uh, those burn prevention efforts have really, really improved. The thing that we see the most of right now with burns, uh, or not the most, but very frequently, and, and it kind of fits with the progression of the elderly and the lack of activity, is we see a lot of. Um, nasal cannula oxygen burns, people still smoking with nasal, nasal cannula oxygen, and I really think that um, it's, that's an education effort for any of you that might have patients that are on HOMO2 and, and to kind of make sure that they're, they're not smoking. In fact, I personally think there ought to be a push for nicotine testing on anybody that's on home oxygen because it's such a big problem that we've had in the burn center. So another, another little... Thing there now scalds are uh, more of a pediatric thing typically, uh, and then we also did a recent study on playground equipment, which was kind of interesting. We had a few playground injuries. In fact, um, in in some of this these new rubberized uh, playground equipment things that the kids are playing on, it gets really hot in the summertime, and we found that uh, the temperatures can get certainly over 120 degrees and even higher. So if you have a baby that you're sitting down on those those uh, rubber mats that are out there, if it's in the hot sun in the summertime, they can clearly get a burn if they're not being moved around. Um, so the surface temperature and contact burns, if you have 140 degrees for more than two seconds, you'll get a burn injury. Um, 130 degrees for more than 30, and 120 for more than five minutes. So it doesn't take that long when the temperatures are really high to get that kind of a, kind of a contact burn. Heating pads and space heaters, I think this is a, this is a big um, thing that we see, especially in the diabetic patient, um, where you have um, abnormal sensation in, in uh, diabetic spinal cord injury patients and also patients with recent surgery. Um, we've also had, uh, we actually had a paper that we had published um, in uh, one of the orthopedic journals about uh, patients who had uh, total knee operations and then had uh, polar pack ice machines and then put ice on top of that and they're very diligent about using their ice but the fact is is that they have a lot of uh, decreased sensation right after surgery so we've had a few people that have had full thickness skin necrosis over the patella after total knee surgery and so that can be uh, a real problematic um, issue and very very uh, concerning to the patient and the surgeon. So estimating depth, uh, you have first degree burns um, which you just have the erythema, second degree burns, which are blisters, intact, the sensation, and pinprick. We can divide those up clinically into superficial burns, which are usually scald, and indeterminate depth burns, which are usually grease or flame burns. Third degree burns, there's no sensation, um, either contact or flame is the usual mechanism. And fourth degree burns are burns that involve deeper structures, muscle tissue, bone, amputation, um, and that is usually electrical burns, although you can see a fourth degree burn to the ear from contacts where we've had very deep ear burns that lead to loss of the ear or no- nasal tip and those kind of areas. So there are some pictures. Uh, second, first degree burns would be the one on the left here with the bad sunburn. Um, the second degree burns would be uh, superficial, it typically shows up as a blister. The indeterminate depth second degree burn would be this hand burn that's here on the right where you have a little bit of mixed sort of pale looking material, um, a little bit of fibrinous exudate. It's kind of a mixed picture. Sometimes they have mixed sensation too on the on pinprick examination. And that's what I usually do when I'm estimating depth of the burn. When I talk about sensation, I'm not talking about just touching it and say, can you feel this? Because, you know, everybody can feel a little bit of pressure there. 
really I'll take a 22 gauge sterile needle and just lightly tap it and see if they can feel the sharpness of that. If they can't feel the sharpness, then you've got, you know you've got a deep, deeper burn. But it's really a sharp, dull sensation I'm talking about, not a light touch. And not, you don't have to do two-point discrimination. You just want to know if they can feel the sharpness. And then on the right side uh, of this, you see a full-thickness leathery burn that, that would be a third-degree flame, uh, characteristic of a third-degree flame burn. Frostbite typically it tends, tends to be even worse than the other injuries, although you can have superficial frostbite injuries. Um, from a management standpoint, frostbite we usually treat, even today, we usually treat expectantly to see how much of the tissue lives, how much of it doesn't live. You, you frequently, it's not uncommon for the skin to turn black. It depends upon how severe the injury is, and it can lead to fourth degree uh, injuries with loss of the digits, such as this case. But sometimes you'll just get it, it'll turn black and the skin will peel off and they'll have all the deep tissues will be, be alive. So you really have to um, just kind of treat those expectantly, treat them with um, topical antibiotics, prevent secondary infection, wait a few weeks and see what it looks like, and then revise the amputations if you have to. Uh, rare, to rare to have to do a skin graft on those because most of the ones that are superficial will heal on their own, but uh, occasionally we will have to do a skin graft on uh, certain areas. Estimating body surface area, many of you have probably seen this diagram before, but the rule of nines um, fits for the adult uh, picture, which is on the left here with the head being nine, the chest, uh, anterior chest 18, the back 18, both arms being nine each, and the legs being uh, 18 as well. Um, and then on the, the children, um, basically is a similar diagram except for their head takes up a larger um, portion of the body surface area, so it counts for 18. Um, and the legs count for proportionately less. Um, who needs referral to a burn center? Anybody with more than a 20% total body surface area, second degree burn. Anybody that with more than 10% full thickness, specialized burns such as hands, face, perineum, electrical and chemical injuries. So let's talk about minor burns since we're really talking about um, minor burns and lacerations here. So. When you have a blister, what do you do with the blister? Really, your options are really to remove it, leave it intact, or aspirate it. It's pretty much that simple. So here's sort of an algorithm that I like to use um, when I'm advising the nurses or treating patients myself. So if you have um, a thin weeping blister, um, we usually uh, go ahead and remove that because we know it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, weeping and cause a lot of drainage and uh, more difficult to manage for the patients, especially if you're talking about an outpatient uh, procedure. If you have um, such as uh, so anything on the pretty much on the dorsum of the hand, other locations, if it's thin and weeping, we'll go ahead and take that out. Um, if um, if it's uh, thicker uh, on on the palm side of the hand, fingertips, I'll usually either leave those intact or aspirate them because the fingertips on the volar side tend to be a little more uncomfortable. So leaving that uh, intact is good. And then you just cover the whole thing with your antibiotic, topical antibiotic, such as silvidine. Some of the, the topical antibiotics we use would be still silver sulfadiazine is our, is our uh, and one of our antibiotics of choice. Um, our mafinite acetate is uh, sulfamylon. We pretty much use that just in the areas of cartilage, such as the ears. Uh, and then bacitracin and polysporin, we usually like to use that on the face. It's a little bit um, easier to uh, manage than the silvidine. Pain control, um, you know, there's a lot of issues about narcotic versus non-narcotic uh, uh, pain management at this time. Um, usually um, try to do narcotics on a very limited basis. For moisturizers, uh, we usually use Nivea cream, um, but uh, there's a whole, whole bunch of over-the-counter uh, moisturizers that you can use. Operative burn treatment. Full thickness burns more than 25 centimeters squared would be a, a general rule of thumb, uh, but it depends on the location. If we've got an open wound on an area where there's loose skin, we'll let that go ahead and contract and may not even require surgery. Uh, but if it's on the hand or over a joint, that 25 centimeters can be pretty significant, especially in the digits. Partial thickness burns, such as that indeterminate depth burn that I showed you with the hand, um, if those take longer than three weeks to heal, they need to be grafted, even though they're partial thickness. They will heal on their own, but 
they heal with a very thick uh, scar typically that can be functionally limiting. I won't say too much about advanced burn uh, or advanced wound dressings right now, but they're they're really much pretty much a hot topic and fidelity um, the fidelity nurses or any home care nurse that you use will um, will be uh, able to um, have these at their disposal. They basically fall into categories though, such as hydrofibers and alginates, hydrogels. Most of them now have silver impregnation within the dressing itself, which um, is allows for an extended release of uh, antibiotic effect. Um, you need to kind of decide what the goals of the treatment are when you're using uh, those advanced wound dressings. Um, if there's a lot of exudate, a lot of drainage, then hydrofibers or alginates are very useful. Um, <clears throat> if you're trying to get something to re-epithelialize in, using a moist uh, dressing such as a hydrogel um, is, is helpful to get those last layer of keratinocytes to migrate over top of the wound. I think it's kind of important to understand the difference between a full thickness wound and a, and a partial thickness wound when you're talking about wound healing in this situation too. Full thickness wounds are wounds that will show granulation tissue, which is that beefy red looking material that's there. Um, that If you see that, that's characteristic of a of scar. Anytime you see that, you're going to have scar. Um, and what that means, what I usually do with that is I'll take some silver nitrate if I see a wound like that and kind of cauterize the top of that area to get it to flatten out because those keratinocytes that are going to try to close the wound, they don't migrate very well up or over a lot of hypertrophic granulation tissue. So that's one of the factors that we'll use, um, cauterize that and then put a hydrogel or some sort of uh, a dressing that's uh, moist over top of that to allow those those wounds to heal a little bit faster. Um, the partial thickness wounds are wounds that still have dermis attached um, underneath that the cells will re-migrate re, uh, up out of the skin appendages and hair follicles and then they'll spread it across the wound itself and that's how those partial thickness wounds will heal. Usually without scarring if they heal, um, if they heal within a few weeks. So this should be actually initial treatment of lacerations. Let's forget about the right side of this slide here. Uh, in lacerations, your, your main goals would be to control bleeding, associate for a, uh, look for associated injuries based on the mechanism, the tetanus status, remove any foreign bodies, uh, and then we have some specific considerations within the face and hand that we want to talk about that you might end up seeing. So controlling hemorrhage, direct pressure for at least five minutes, um, especially in the hand, and this is something that is, um, is really, even if the radial artery is lacerated and you see a very, usually that's very dramatic when they come into the office or the emergency room or when you see it with the pumping blood coming out of the wrist and everything, but it's very, typically very easy to control with direct pressure. Uh, almost always um, with direct pressure, and you can wrap it with a coban and elevate it, it'll stop within a few minutes. Um, you don't need to be clamping everything and doing all that other stuff. It's just direct pressure. And for the rare case when it doesn't stop, a tourniquet is reasonable, 100 millimeters above systolic uh, for up to two hours if you're in the emergency room or whatever you have available if you're out in the field. Um, exceptions would be anticoagulated patients, um, patients on aspirin, Plavix, Coumadin. You'd have to do the routine set steps, but sometimes you'll need to add topical hemostatics, check Coag profiles, and occasionally you have to admit these patients to, to correct their coagulopathy before you can do anything with the lacerations. So associated injuries, obviously motor vehicle crashes will need a trauma evaluation, rule out spine fractures, rule out other fractures. Um, and also you need to rule out open fracture as a source of your, of your um, um, laceration. Uh, some exceptions to that would be mandible fractures and hand fractures. Um, other than that, uh, and uh, Dr. Ben Katharapa will talk a little bit later probably about open fractures, but um, when you talk about, and from a plastic surgery standpoint, virtually every mandible fracture is going to be an open fracture. You're going to have a laceration inside the mouth where the teeth are separated or there's going to be like so. It's it really because the blood supply is so good in that area, it's not one of those things where they have to immediately go to the operating room and be washed out and everything. You just clean them up and you know, give them a soft diet, and we usually fix those a few days later or whenever um, the operating room is available. 
in terms of hand fractures is basically the same. We wash them out in the emergency room, close them, and usually we'll repair them either at the same time or later, but it's not an, it's not an absolute emergent uh, trip to the operating room. Uh, and of course, tetanus status, everybody's aware of. In terms of foreign bodies, it's a source of infection, potentially remove it when feasible. Um, and then uh, in terms of what shows up on a plain x-ray, wood typically doesn't show up on a plain x-ray, so there's no point in getting an x-ray for splinters or those kind of things. Plastic can show up depending upon the type and density and whether or not there's any paint. And then also uh, metal, which obviously does show up. Specific considerations would be uh, lacrimal ducts around the eyelids, uh, the cheek, we have facial nerve branches, and the parotid duct in the forehead, we have su superorbital nerve branches, which causes forehead numbness. And then uh, laterally, you can have the temporal branch of the facial nerve, which causes brow ptosis on that side if it's injured. In the neck, if it penetrates the platysma, that's a uh, laceration can be extremely uh, dangerous, so that needs to be uh, imaged and uh, or operative exploration with endoscopy. Nasal fractures, if somebody has an injury to the nose, you want to make sure you look inside the nose and make sure the septum does not have a hematoma in the, in the nasal septum. It's pretty easy to see. Um, you see a big bulge on the, on the inside of the nose. If they get a septal hematoma, the late complication of that is that the cartilage necrosis and they'll get a septal perforation, which is extremely difficult to, um, difficult to treat um, later. And so that's an important uh, factor. And if it's bad enough, the whole, what you see, what you can see as a late deformity from that would be a, uh, uh, a saddle nose deformity, which you see in boxers frequently, where the nose is collapsed in and the whole cartilage support is gone from the nose. So... That's frequently due to septal hematomas that are unrecognized. Uh, so look inside the nose when you, when you have or suspect a nasal fracture. You can't just kind of look at the outside of it. Um, chin lacerations, uh, marginal mandibular branch, which comes uh, up to the lower portion of the, um, uh, or the outer portion of the lower lip, which gives you sort of the St Sylvester Stallone look if you have that, um, where one por portion is there. Um, that um, is also uh, something that usually is difficult to treat, uh, even operatively, because those branches are so small that when we have a laceration in there, we've, we've, we've really, in 18 years, never been able to um, really successfully make that injury better. Um, so, because we will go in there, and even if you try to find it, the branches are so small, even under the microscope, and then you, they kind of branch out so that even if you find one or two, it doesn't bring back enough of the muscle plus the combination of the scarring um, makes that a difficult injury to treat. So you just really, for, from our standpoint, we treat the skin, make the scar as good as we can, and then let the patients know about the weakness they're going to have. Sometimes it does get better over time, but typically not. In terms of a hand examination, I'm sure uh, Andres will talk to you guys about this a little later, but make a fist is not an adequate exam. When you see a hand injury in a patient, you can't just say, can you make a fist? That doesn't really tell us anything as a hand surgeon. It doesn't really help I mean, in terms of uh, understanding what's going on, whether or not the patient has an actual injury. Um, so after you control bleeding, you need to do a sensory exam and then um, uh, anesthetize a digit, not the other way around. <laughs> Because we frequently will get a call from the emergency room, like, well, does he have sensation? They'll say, oh, well, we blocked him up, so now you don't know if the digital nerve is injured or not. So it's, uh, I mean, all this sounds, I know it sounds basic, but we see it every, almost every week where something like this has happened. So with a digital block, um, we use 1% uh, lidocaine, um, 5 to 10 cc's, the dorsal digital block. We usually can use two sticks. Um, and use pressure from the dorsal side or a single bowler stick, um, usually right at the metacarpal uh, flangeal joint crease there. And epinephrine, this is another old adage that I kind of want to talk about because you get, everybody gets told never to use um, epinephrine in the digits or end organs of the finger, toes, nose, and hose, and it's not appropriate uh, based on uh, fear of... Uh, end organ damage. Um, so, you know, at least um, moderate skin bleeding occurs if not used in the ear, it makes it very difficult to, uh, to repair because you're 
and I've got bleeding everywhere. So we use it in circumcision. We use it, um, you know, in the, in the digits now. So it's really, um, I don't know where, we use it in the ears and the nose on a daily basis. So I think that was something that was perpetuated throughout the history of, of the emergency room and everybody was taught that stuff. But epinephrine doesn't last that long. It doesn't cause necrosis. They were going to get necrosis. The only place I probably wouldn't use it is if somebody had like um, either previous vascular path, um, in other words, if they've got a history of Raynaud's phenomena or something like that, or you know they've got a steel phenomena from their digit, and they're, and they're teetering on it anyway, then I might not use epinephrine in a digit. Um, but um, other than that, that's about it. You know, the only other place would be perhaps if I have an ear laceration where we've seen ears that are kind of hanging on by just a small piece of skin. Probably wouldn't anesthetize that last little bit with, with it, but then the ear's not bleeding that much anyway at that point. So and those, those ears will survive dramatic with just hanging on maybe a centimeter of skin. I've seen a whole ear survive with just that. So it's pretty interesting in terms of what will survive in those situations. So um, it makes your life a lot easier if you use a little bit of epinephrine in your local anesthetics. Hand exams. Um, so when I was talking about earlier about making a fist, you need to really examine the cascade of the hand at rest. So that means that if you've got one, two fingers that are out like this at rest, those, those flexor tendons are probably injured. Just looking at it at rest is fine. You can move the wrist and the, and the whole tenodesis effect. You should see the tendons. If the tendons are intact, they should move. Um, you can examine the uh, flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor digitorum profundus individually. So to do the FDP tendon, which is the one that inserts into the distal phalanx, you block the middle phalanx and just ask the patients to bend the tip of the finger. If you want to test for the FDS tendon to see if that's intact, you hold the remaining digits out and ask them to flex. You can see that when you do that, it's very hard to flex your distal phalanx when you've got the rest of the digits out in extension. And the reason for that is because the flexor digitorum profundus muscle is a common muscle belly in the forearm. So because it's a common muscle belly in the forearm, it does, when you hold the, um, the remaining digits out, you can't flex that distal interphalangeal joint. So the other factor would be the uh, central slip, which is the extensor tendon over the PIP joint. And I'll show you a few things about that uh, later, and I'm sure Dr. Andresh will talk about dislocations. Subungual hematomas are also a frequent thing that you see, which are nail bed injuries where you have a hematoma under the nail bed. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. So the importance of the central slip, when you have a cut that's over the proximal interphalangeal joint, what happens is that you can see you have the lateral band. Well, here's my pointer. have this lateral band that's part of the intrinsic musculature of the hand. This intrinsic musculature means that it's muscles that are distal to the wrist. So they're not the pulmonary and both monoxidi plus the numbers that they are in the They form this lateral tendon, the lateral band here, that normally is dorsal to the axis of the CIP joint. What happens is if you have a cut across the CIP joint and cut that central tendon, the central tendon is the terminal insertion of the sensory digital tendon, which is the extrinsic musculature of the forearm, can help you extend that. So if you cut that, then what happens is that these attachments that hold the lateral band dorsal to the axis of the CIP can fall away from the axis, and then you get hyper instead of getting a tension of the flat top and then you get flexion in the case of the So you get a late root near deformity. So it's something that looks like a minor laceration but can become a bigger deal later. Um, so one or two stitches in that extension tendon and some splinting will prevent an almost an uncorrectable boot near deformity later. So it's something that's simple to repair early, but if they show up in your office, you know, six six weeks later is very difficult to fix. Fingertip injuries, I'm not sure if you were you planning on talking about that? Okay, well, I'll skip over this a little bit, just give you a little bit, but if it's skin, one centimeter, you can let it heal in. More than a centimeter, no exposed bone, you can consider a uh, skin graft, and more than that, uh, flap reconstruction. And you can do a B to Y flap or a two-stage thenar flap. So it depends upon the angle, really. 
And I'll go ahead and go over this since you can just reiterate it. Maybe. Um, so you have a distinct point of angle at If this bowler, though, you don't have enough tissue to do that, we have to bring tissue from somewhere else. In that case, we do a thenar flap that looks something like this. So we sew that down to the, we sew the, the tip down to the palm, leave it there, and what happens is, and this is a common thing in plastic surgery where you have ingrowth from the palm into the tip of the finger, so you can you can leave you leave that attached for about two weeks, then come back, divide it, and then you have a good pad on the fingertip. Subungal hematomas, if it's under 50%, you can usually drain them, usually with ophthalmic cautery. Some people will take a heated up uh, paper clip. Either way, just drain it. Um, if it's over 50%, usually remove the nail plate, repair the nail bed with a 6 or 7 nail chromic, and replace the nail plate for protection. So, nail bed anatomy review, just uh, go over real quick. Um, germinal matrix, uh, lunula is 90 to 94% of the nail plates formed there. That's where you, uh, I think I have, yeah. So, you have the lunula, which is the half moon thing, which is the base of your, that's the base of your, uh, nail is the thing that goes up to the top of that thing. Square matrix is here, and then at the very top of square matrix, that's the thing that's the nail. So, that can make you a hole down here in this location, and really that's the dorsal roof, and the dorsal roof is what puts the shine on the nail. So, if you have if somebody shows up with a rough nail, um, then that's because those dors dorsal root cells aren't working very well. Either they're infected with fungus, or there's a burn injury that's caused it to retract, or it's missing altogether. Um, so extensor tendons typically can be repaired in the emergency room. Uh, if they don't retract up into the forearm, flexor tendons uh, need to be done in the operating room due to the location of the neurovascular bundles. So some of the principles of repair, uh, clean debris to devitalize tissue, um, remove any foreign bodies. Um, and as a plastic surgeon, probably the only thing that we do that, that's that much different, I would say, than what's done in the emergency room is we pretty much excise every wound. So we'll take a, after we numb it up, we'll excise, because frequently any laceration, even if it looks clean and looks like it's a sharp cut, what ends up happening is it's very, very rarely cut directly straight down the middle. In other words, it's usually skived a little bit here or there, and then their dermis isn't lining up right. So we just re-excise it so that it's a straight line. And that's how, you know, that's probably the only technical difference we do between what other people would do just in terms of putting stitches in. Um, so um, if the extensor tendon is injured, we usually use a three or four of uh, braided nylon suture, or permanent suture, and skin closure with four nylon or chromic. I've gone more, the older I get, the more I use chromic in the emergency room for hand injuries because when you see these patients a couple weeks later and there's blood on their stitch, suture line and everything, if it's chromic, you can just let it go and the stitches will fall out in another couple of weeks. If you use nylon, you gotta dig them out in the, in the office and nobody's happy, your nurse can give you dirty looks and everything, so you just wanna, from my, from my viewpoint, I, I really like to use chromic, especially in the hand. Whether it's absorbable. Um, splinting, you have uh, finger splints to tip, you have the cap, you have bone metal splints for digits, and then uh, plaster splints, which I'm sure uh, we'll hear a little bit more about later. So the other, so the other big myth that I kind of wanted to dispel today is, besides the epinephrine myth, is the timing myth in terms of lacerations. Because um, I, I had, we had this happen just the other day that somebody drove two hours sat in the emergency room for another hour, in the, and the, it was six hours and 15 minutes after their la facial laceration, and the ER doc said, I'm sorry, we can't fix this up. If you'd been here, we'd saw, seen you 15 minutes early where we could have closed this. I mean, they actually said that. <laughs> like, you've got to be kidding me. So they show up in the office and they close. But I mean, it's like, you see these kind of, people get so dogmatic about what they're doing, you know, that, that they don't use common sense sometimes. So. You, you, um, so basically, we um, any anything that can be excised, it's not grossly infected, especially in the face, you will close, and it doesn't matter when. 
Uh, we see them, we see, um, in fact, uh, one of the more recent things that's happened is uh, some of you may be associated with a dermatologist or have heard dermatologists use Mo do Mohs micrographic surgery to remove skin cancers, uh, usually on the face, but they do in other locations. Well, frequently they'll do these things, they'll take a big chunk out of a cheek and they'll send it to the office to be closed. And they'll show up two, three days later sometimes, we close them up, debride them, size the wound completely, get, a, get to a fresh wound and close them in the office. And so we don't have to take them to the operating room. We don't force the patient to do dressing care and leave them with a hole in their face indefinitely. We just do what's called a delayed primary closure, and it's uh, it's okay. Where when would I not do that? Uh, there's there's certain situations where you don't want to do it, so it does take some clinical judgment. And that would be if you've got a, any kind of foreign body, if you've got dirt, any kind of you know a dirty wound or a potentially infected wound. You wouldn't want to do that. You'd, you'd want to clean it up first, maybe even do a debridement, then see them back the next week, and then do a closure yourself. So you have to kind of, I'm not saying always do it, but make sure that you that the, that the six-hour window is no longer uh, really appropriate. Um, so yeah, I use epi in all areas of the face. Um, and you want to see some blanching of the, the nose and the ear when you're doing those things. Don't worry about it because it'll get better over time and you'll be able to do a much nicer repair. Uh, when you're using epinephrine, wait, try to wait 7 to 10 minutes before starting your debridement because that's how long it takes the epinephrine to start working. Um, and then again, like I said before, the exceptions would be don't use it if you've got a nearly amputated digit or extremity. Eyelid margins. Um, when you're talking about repairing eyelids, this is something that's maybe not necessarily minor, but also is important to notice, note is you'll have the anterior mid and posterior lamella concept, which means the conjunctiva would be posterior lamella, the uh, orbital septum and muscle would be mid lamella, and then the skin would be anterior. So you can think about when you see a deformity uh, of a patient that you might have and you wonder, well, wonder what's going on there, you can kind of divide it up. If they've got an entropion, that's usually a um, a uh, it, um, posterior lamellar problem. If they've got an ectropion, that's usually can be a um, anterior or a um, mid lamellar problem because it could be mid lamellar because if they've got a senile ectropion where the tarsus is just lax, then that could be um, that could be the source, and you may need to do a tarsal tightening. If it's a scar tissue from either a laceration or a burn injury, then usually that's skin a skin problem that may need a graft. To fix that, so it depends. Uh, superior canaliculus, you can the, the canaliculi are the tear ducts, uh, which are on the medial side of the eyelid. Uh, there's a superior and inferior. Um, most of the time, especially in an elderly patient, if it's superior canaliculus, we don't usually repair those because they can usually drain through the inferior. Um, if it's the inferior canaliculus, typically you know, we will go ahead and repair that in the operating room under a microscope. Um, if you don't repair those, what you typically see is uh, epiphora, which is chronic tearing, and uh, that sometimes will need additional uh, oculoplastic surgery to fix that. These are the kind of lacerations you see. Parotid duct uh, failure to repair usually uh, leads to salivary fistula, and uh, the landmark would be a cheek laceration that kind of is in the line between the tragus of the ear and the cap and midway between the ala and the upper lip, uh, which is about where the second molar is. And you can just draw that line. Any laceration in the cheek that's in that location, you, know, you need to be very suspicious of the product duct. And in that case, you may need to have an operative exploration or at least a plastic surgery consult for something like that. Um, the outcomes of facial repairs, um, really there's a lot of patient factors that go into how these things do. Um, Patients with the pale skin, especially young kids, the toe-headed kids, they typically get very hypertrophic scars. African descent uh, patients are prone or more prone to keloids. Uh, mechanism factors, the biggest factor in my opinion about uh, outcome with these is really, is the tissue there or not? I mean, if we can have, we've seen, we've had patients that have had massive injuries where the whole nose is peeled off and looks awful and you take these pictures and you're like, Look how bad this is, but actually everything's there, and you just fold it back over, put a few stitches in, it looks great, you know, and you think you, you're a genius. And then you have other patients who really have had massive tissue destruction from shotgun blasts to the face and those kind of things, and there's no, 
no amount of plastic surgery is going to help that. I mean, you, it'll help it, but you're never going to get short of a face transplant, which is the latest top topic. Hot topic. Uh, you're never going to get that back to normal. Uh, but in terms of minor lacerations, um, I think uh, it's important to identify the linear versus the trapdoor concept. And I'll show you that in a second and try to explain that uh, in the Langer's line concept. So if you look at, especially in the aging face, you, you have sort of, certain very characteristic patterns of wrinkles. So on the forehead, you have the transverse lines. Between the brows, you have the vertical lines. You have nasal lines. You have typically uh, radial lines around the upper lip and the crow's feet on the eyes. Those are all very characteristic, and they're due to the pull of the underlying muscles. So as we get older, our skin gets a little brittle, and then the pull of those muscles basically cracks the skin, and you have very classic lines where these things happen. And so you want to try and put your, or you, your so in, when you're kind of evaluating what the outcome is going to be, if that, if that laceration is in one of those lines, typically it's going to look okay. If it's against it, then that's the patients who you might say, well, usually we don't do a scar revision immediately, but we may, we may you say, well, you know, we might have to do a scar revision down the road if this doesn't heal the way we want it to. Um, the provider factors, I talked a little bit about the sharp uh, debridement, uh, well approximated small suture for the face. We use 6 suture. Um, I use chromic on a scalp and plain gut. Uh, on some difficult patients who we definitely don't want to uh, take out su sutures on. So this is the trapdoor concept. This would be um, a patient who had a, a laceration. Well, this part of the laceration is all fine, but when you get down to this, this bend, what happens is, is that all scars tend to shorten over time. They heal by shortening and contraction. And when that happens is, is that this tissue that's in the center, because it's scar shortened, it lumps up the tissue that's in the middle, okay? So what you usually see is not so much that the scar is better or worse, but what you see is how the light hits the scar. When you have an irregularity or a lump in the middle, then that's what you see. And those kind of patients, these kind of patients, and even though I'll go ahead and repair it uh, the same way initially, these kind of patients, when they have this kind of laceration, I'll say, you might have to come back and do a Z-plasty or a D-plasty or some kind of scar revision later to improve that. Because you can't really dermabrade those, it doesn't really help. If you've got this normal tissue in the middle, that's the problem, not the scar itself. So in conclusion, I think we've provided sort of an overview of lacerations and burn treatment and uh, view of some of the current clinical practice and uh, questions are wrong. How would you want to work people to start in the portal? How do you revise vertical scars for it? Yeah, um, interesting. <coughs> vertical scars in the forehead are one place that they usually do pretty well. Foreheads, and that's the other thing I really didn't get into, would be um, the location. Like cheek scars tend to be worse than foreheads that tend to be worse than ears. Um, when, you, when you do a scar revision, there's basically two ways in which we do scar revisions. One is with a W-plasty, the other is with a Z-plasty. A Z-plasty, we use, usually use on larger areas, so we'll use a, a Z-plasty like in the web space of a hand. On the face, we almost always do W-plasty. Um, W-plasty is basically, if you imagine, if you took a pair of pinking shears that have the zigzags, you just, you just cut the skin like that. We don't have pinking shears that we use in surgery, but we make that same kind of cut that's just a running W, and we do the same thing on the other side that matches, and then the skin, then they interdigitate like that. So you, the concept is with any scar revision is that you're that you're actually changing the direction of the scar. So a higher percentage of the scar is going along the transverse side than vertically. Running W plus side. Yeah. Uh, patient with frequent laceration and say, what can we put on the scar to make it not so? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good question actually. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, one of the other older plastic surgeons in town that did a lot of work at Children's, he, I would see some of his patients later, and, like a year after they'd had their initial repair, and they'd still have tape, like a Steri-Strip, on their incision, like a year afterwards. He's, and I'm like, just take that off, it's no big deal. And, you know, this guy's, that, that guy's crazy, you, know, you don't have to do that. Well, and I kept saying this for years, I kept saying, because people would come to me and they'd say, well, do I still need this tape? But he tells me I still need this tape. and. Uh, and the funny thing is, is like, and I kept pulling it off and telling him it's okay, don't worry about it. 
funny thing is, is that a few few years after I'd been doing that, there was actually a double blind randomized or, or a randomized trial using tape versus no tape for scars, and that seems to be the thing that makes the most difference is taping scars. And we do that in the burn unit quite a bit too. We use like in the fat scars, we use hyperfix tape or silicone tape or something that puts pressure on it and keeps it from spreading out. So the answer is, is that the only thing that the study that I know that actually is randomized has been taping of the, of the lacerations, okay? Now, that having been said, a lot of people don't want to wear tape all the time. So you know, from a practical standpoint, uh, what we usually recommend is massage and anything they want to put on it. Cocoa butter, vitamin E cream. If they want to spend the extra money on Moderna, that's fine. There's a lot of testimonial evidence out about that, but there's not any scientific evidence. So really it's probably the act of massage and time that makes the most difference as well as the well as the location, but moisturizer okay. and massage. But the taping was not like the steri strips you put on. They you, were you different. You can use steri strips for larger areas. You can use hypofix. Okay. Those kind okay. of things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because some patients will come back in and they'll still have their steri strips on. Right. You know. When you can have them, take them off and replace it too, and okay. you can wear it at night. You know those kind of things. So you okay. can know the more you use it, the better. But, yeah. Okay. okay. Is any one kind of hydro pack better than another? Hydro for burns. Hydro pack? Well, you know, you get like the burn free, um, uh, and there's another one now. Uh, I forget the name of it right now. But yeah. If you have like a burn, put it on top of it, it helps take away the, the sting right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't, to be honest with you, I don't have much experience with that. Okay. We really don't use hydro packs very much. We use what we typically do would just be something more simple, like a cool washcloth or something like that. Yeah. If you have it, I don't see any problem with using it, but um, use it judiciously because sometimes the technology is too good. <laughs> if you put it on, if it's actually too cool, you can make the thermal injury worse. So that's why we, we like to use just cool soaks and then reapply them because until we get to until we get to see them um, because by the time sometimes you, you can see you know, the technology is okay it's too cool but it's too cool and is that so I, I just use cool soaks. I have a question. Uh, I work urgent care on weekends and every weekend there's some little kid who comes in with a laceration of their face. I uh, usually it's forehead or chin and you said something about uh, little children who may have hypertrophic scarring, especially if they're blockheaded. Is there any benefit to steri stripping yep. versus suture? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think, no, I, th I think the best thing to do initially is the suture. I mean, almost always. Uh, depends upon if it's a full thickness cut, of course, or not. Uh, steri strips I only use if it's a, if it's a skiving type of a uh, partial thickness laceration or something. Uh, but almost always uh, we try and suture those. Uh, the steri stripping I think is beneficial after the initial repair, but it's not a substitute for it. I think if you have a skyping type laceration, sometimes derma bond or you know, some of those things are helpful for the, that kind of thing. And a kid that you don't have to worry about. In fact, my partner is a craniofacial plastic surgeon who does uh, cleft lips and palates. I don't do those, but he does them. And uh, he was telling me that they put like five layers of dermabond on their cleft lip repair so they can still pull them apart. It's almost like a cast on the face so they use the glue. Hmm. So massage, you need it on the chin because I have a granddaughter and that just was, they tend to just keep doing it. Yeah, 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 the massage is good. It's, I think there's some of, some of these factors, like the outcomes most of the time are related primarily to the patient factors. And what kind of skin they have, not what they do to it, but what what their genetics are, and then also um, and also the technical repair can have something to do with it. Uh, but everybody, and I think it's okay to get people to massage and to do these things because it gets them involved in things and it you know it makes them uh, you know, sort of feel like they're involved in, in the outcome, which is generally a good thing. But does it actually make a difference? Not really any great scientific evidence.